What's recognised is that this is a long-term change. It's taken us a long time to get to the kind of delivery of public services we've got right now. It's taken us a long time to get to the kind of relationships across the, the public, the person, the family, all the providers who know the person and the family so well, and the commissioners of services, you know, to get to the point where we've actually got quite a clunky divide has taken us quite a long time. But we have managed to separate things off far too much, and I'm sure you all feel that. Person-centred work is at the heart of everything you do, and we know that. It's just been hard for the local authorities to maintain that collective, collaborative approach to the work um, over the increasing procedurally driven um, way in which public services have worked. On the whole, big organisations have to try and standardise things, but by standardising them, you lose the uniqueness of the human being. So what everyone is trying to get back to is take the opportunity of a new beginning enshrined in our act that gives us the chance to get um, a different way of talking to each other, talking to our service users, engaging around service delivery. So we're just going to be reflecting on that um, over the next couple of hours, a chance to hear your views and for Fiona to take those back because it's just another step in trying to achieve something we all hold dear, I guess. And going around the country listening to providers, um, this is something you all do. You're no strangers to what we're about to be talking about, but you do experience difficulties on the edges of your contractual arrangements with other professionals. So it's, it's making sure that we can get to a point where that runs more smoothly um, and in a better way for our service users. Just to mention that there is everything that we'll talk about today and I'll mention on the slides and so on is in this booklet and this will come out to you all electronically. Um, so as long as your name is on the list and if your name wasn't on the list that you've added your email address on then everyone will receive this electronically. So unless you like taking notes, there's no need for that. So just a chance to think about um, the act, what this means for us, to hear from you a bit about what you've noticed um, in terms of changes, if any, um, and bring to life really some of the meaning behind the words, because there's a lot of words out there now, outcomes is one of them. And it's really important that we all have a shared view of what that means. You know, if, out, if we're having outcome-focused work, what does that look like and how do we reflect it? And for all of you, I guess, how do we demonstrate it to each other that we're working in an outcome-focused way? So we will have time to think about that. So the opportunity that this act gives us is an opportunity to do things differently. And it's something that everyone welcomes you know all the all the social workers we're working with all the local authorities although they have to dig deep to make this change they welcome the opportunity to do it because people do feel that they've got overly curtailed in their practice by the processes that have limited the engagement with human beings over the last 18 months, and um, my, as I say, my background is in social work across a wide range, child protection, adult services, mental health, older persons, a wide range of provision. Um, but the last two years, I've been working alongside Social Care Wales on their improvement agenda, helping local authorities think about not just what does the Act say, but if we manage to change in line with the Act, what does our work look like? That's, we've got to have a sense, not only of the vision, but also how we affect the work. So we've worked with every local authority, adults and children services across Wales, and they are working together to try and bring about a change. So we'll be very interested to hear if you've noticed a different quality in the care plans you're getting, a different kind of conversation. Maybe not, um, but if you have, it'd be good to hear. One of the things, as I've already said, is that government, heads of service, uh, gradually politicians at every level recognising that we have become overly prescriptive in our style and approach. You know, an assessment doc document now for a social worker has become so comprehensive that they end up having the wrong kind of conversation with people right from the very beginning, asking them all kinds of information 
that isn't relevant to the person they're talking to, isn't helpful in building trust and um, in the system. So thinking about um, all of that is an important part of the, ch the shift. You know, if I, was, if I was waiting at home for someone to come out and assess me, whatever the situation I was in, that would make me nervous. If I was going to be assessed, I could fail. And if I failed the assessment, what would that mean to me? If they didn't give me a service or they gave, did something to me I didn't want? So right from the very beginning, we've created a kind of discomfort. And many of our service users go through one assessment after another, don't they? To try and get to a service. So, so much of that has to be changed and many authorities are trying not to use the word now. Um, when they're talking to their public. And that's, that's probably something that's um, close to your hearts as well. The other thing about those conversations is they've been very driven by trying to ascertain whether someone hits a criteria or a threshold or is allowed a service. Now, what that has done over time is ensure that people have very negative conversations. All the conversations have been about the deficits and what people can't do so that the social worker could go back to the base and crash this case through the thresholds of the panel to ensure they get a service. What that leaves in terms of our service user is a feeling of just having one conversation after another about what they can't do. It's a demoralizing process. So when we start talking to local authorities about bringing back a more strengths-based approach, lot, lots of things have to change how they capture the information, what they think is important, how they make decisions about allocation of provision and all, everything has to change. So they're digging deep and trying to ensure that the system is complying with the spirit of the act at, at every level. So what they're trying to move to is ensuring that every worker, every skilled worker across Wales has the opportunity to engage in those empowering conversations with people uniting all of us in the fact that we're dealing with people who are facing challenging situations and that we have to have sensitive conversations with people to enable them to start to make sense of what's going on for them in their lives. So collaborative conversations across the piece is what we're trying to encourage. <coughs> so you may be noticing a change in the care plans. You may be noticing and starting to see more outcome focused care plans coming through to you. You may be noticing the more strengths-based assessment. So you're getting a bigger picture of a person, their life, their history, what they can do as well as what they can't do. So your starting point is much more balanced and more open. Um, that a feeling like we're in it together, that we can make a collaborative communication around the service user to the outcome, that means flexible conversations. It doesn't mean receiving a care plan with minimal instructions about tasks and then a, a review of that six months down the line, checking whether the service is still happening. Reviews should be changing in their feel. It shouldn't be about reviewing the service, it should be about reviewing the person and their hopes and aspirations. A real opportunity for providers to say, things are different than they were when we met this person and we need to be taking that on board. So that kind of listening conversation, regularly communicating together um, and working together, a shared understanding of what all our work is leading to for the service user. So what the Act asks of us, asks of um, workers, is to ascertain and have regard to people's views and wishes. We don't, have a, we don't find out what people's views and wishes are unless we have sensitive conversations where we're listening to hard to what's going on. One of the things that's captured people around the country is this concept of what matters. Has everybody heard that phrase, what matters to people? Um, and in some areas that's been interpreted very literally. So into their early conversations they put a question, what matters to you? Um, the whole concept of what matters needs to be a principle that underpins our work, not a question that we ask people. If I, oh, sorry Andrew, knocking my mic. If I uh, was walking down the street today and someone stopped me and asked me what matters to me, I'd struggle to answer that question. 
So unless I'm in a sensitively guided conversation, I won't get to be able to articulate that or even think about what things are going on that matter to me. But we've had some interpretations where social workers have had referrals from hospitals saying, oh, I've had the what matters conversation, it's a walk-in shower. End of conversation. So we need to get to a process of much more flexible understanding of what trying to get to the important things for people actually means. And that means thinking about how people ascertain views, wishes, and feelings. And from that ascertaining of those feelings, we can get to people beginning to articulate what an outcome would be. Similarly, if I said, what's your outcome? Wouldn't even know what anybody meant. So they, that emerges out of our conversations with people. One of the things we all need to be thinking about, therefore, is how we help start to ascertain the wishes and views of people. And then how we take due regard of that. What kind of training, what kind of supervision, what kind of discussion goes on that gives our staff the best chance to let us know what they're ascertaining in terms of the views and wishes. So we all can have some control out over that. You know, if, um, if we believe in valuing our staff's conversations, but there's no room in their job role or their support to have a conversation about what they've ascertained, then we miss all of that. So social workers and social work teams are being asked to give time and attention to supporting those conversations and giving due regard to those things. Um, so those insights can grow. Um, social Services and Wellbeing Act. Enshrined in law, the opportunity to explore um, people's well-being and think about how what we all offer contributes to that. So when we think about a sense of well-being, how would all of you describe that from your own personal point of view? What is it that you need in your life that gives you a sense of well-being? Feeling like we're in control of things and we're in control of our environment and it's a safe place to be feeling as strong as we can be in the circumstances we're in. Understanding where I fit in my world, in society, what my place is. My place in society. <laughs> and and th that's a two-way process, isn't it? Who do I give to? Who do I receive from? What, how productive am I? What contribution do I make to the world around me? It's really important, isn't it, that place we have in society. And it's a give-and-take place um, where we can care for others and be cared for. So are those relationships crucial? What else? So to be able to make decisions for myself uh, is a really important sense of well-being. You know, however difficult the decisions are, I feel like I need to make them for myself if I'm going to feel as good as I can be in my world. Anything else? Yeah, a sense of being at the driving seat of whatever happens, being in charge. Yeah. Any other thoughts about your own personal lives? What matters to you? Family. Family. Relationships. The interplay of those. Being able to love and care for people as well as being loved and cared for. All of those things are part of what helps people to feel uh, a sense of well-being. So we need to be thinking about those things when we're engaging with, and I know you all are, engaging with our service users and their families, with the, the need to feel loved and be loved, the need to have relationships. Even if we've lost all the old relationships, building new ones is still part of our life, you know, as we keep moving forward. Feeling respected. So some of you were talking about getting better pictures of people, whole lives, not just what we see now in this moment and this discussion about what they can't do, but all those years that went before, all the things that makes that person who they are and respecting that. For all of us, we need a sense of purpose. We give up if there isn't one. So we need to be thinking about what contribution I make um, to people around us. All of those things are crucial to people. Uh, and what's happened in the system is it's gone very much down the risk of a safety world as if that was the most important thing and that can be counterproductive to a sense of well-being 
So one of the things we're working very hard with local authorities about is about thinking about risk and how people manage risk, how people make choices for themselves. Uh, one of the things about processes and procedures is the um, people coming in and asking to see a risk assessment document on the file, for instance. Arguably, a risk assessment document doesn't tell you anything about whether someone's safe or not. It's just a list. What we need to be evidencing is that this person and this family understand what the priority risks are and have a plan for how they're going to deal with it if it should happen. So that we're focusing on the most important things for people and helping them describe how they manage their own risk. That's where a sense of well-being comes from. That's where being in the driving seat comes from, controlling my environment, being able to make my own decisions. So one of the things we're asking local authorities to do and CSIW and others is look for evidence of risk management that's engaged people around what's really important to them and that they now have a way of functioning if those risks to happen. So that may, might be that the family's all clamoring for safety around mum because she's wandered or fallen. What would, you, what would you all do? What would mum do if she were to fall? What would she do? The, what was everybody else gonna do? Once we got that plan in place, they can be freed up to live a life that doesn't have to be risk-free because the end product otherwise for mum is she gets put somewhere she doesn't want to be. So thinking about those things. In child protection, working with people who say, well, the biggest risk for us is when the stress gets so great, we both have a drink and we end up in violence in the home. What is it that you can all do to avert that risk? Work with the family and they tell you. Well, if I were to have a drink, then this is what I might do instead. This is how the children respond. This is how the family respond. Suddenly, you've got something meaningful and real around risk management that put people back uh, in the driving seat. So when we think about well-being, we have to recognize that over the decades, we've moved into risk-averse situations, and we need to get back to enabling people to find a way to achieve their sense of well-being. So are people... Do people recognise that kind of whole holistic picture? I imagine you do in your work settings. And sometimes for people, it's just those little things every day that make a difference, and we need to be listening for those. You know, I think of um, a 94-year-old gentleman I was talking to, and he was, he'd had the most amazing life, staggering impact his life had had. Um, and now he couldn't do any of the things he used to do. He's frail. But he described beautifully, sitting in the passenger seat of his daughter's car, he had four children. She's going, he's just going to sit there as she drives around her busy day. He's enormously proud of her and all she's achieving and feels that pride and, and pleasure in that relationship. The sun shining through the windscreen of the car and he's feeling warm and cosy in that passenger seat. It's good enough for him. And he described it so beautifully. And you know that anything we do to help in this situation has got to have that at the heart of it. There's his well-being described. So he knows that he's not going to be able to do all those things anymore, but this is important to him, and he's able to describe that sense of well-being. And I think of um, a, a little girl, seven years old, talking about what matters to her and what's important to her and describing a picture of being on the city with mum and her brother and her dad, uh, having a kutch on the city, watching their favourite programme, throwing their heads back in la with laughter, crying with laughter. Her dad's in prison and they're waiting with some fear and anticipation for his return, not quite sure how it's all going to be. And she drew this picture and she wrote this little piece about what that looked like and she sent it to dad in prison. Made a massive difference to him thinking about coming home and what's important to his little girl. So when we've got skilled staff listening to those stories, engaging with people about what's important, it's really, really important to value it, listen to, and hang on to it when we're building plans of support from the inside of the family out, not trying to inflict things on people from the outside. So it's not hard to think about an outcome when we think about it from the conversations we have with our service users um, and think about those real stories. It's much more than an academic process. 
you know, we had um, enormous amount of help from colleagues in Scotland as we were working through outcomes in, in Wales. Um, and they shared lots of things with us, which were very helpful. Um, well, one of the things they said is we tried for years to develop a, um, a drop-down system in social workers' computers, which had any possible outcome that anyone could think of, so that they could drop it down and click on the box. And it didn't work. It didn't work. Because there was always something missing or it was too... This is what works, having a conversation with people, listening hard and enabling people to start to articulate an outcome that's important to them. And we know that not everyone can articulate, that many of the service users we're working with are struggling with ways of describing, but it's so important that we don't throw all the skills out. You know, if there's somebody living with dementia, you know how, you, how their outcome emerges. You know how to observe whether that's working. You consult with families, with the care group. You know whether someone's anxiety is coming down or going up. We know with children. We know with teenagers how you get past. If you just say to a teenager, uh, what's important to you? They're going, well, I don't know. <laughs> so you're working much more skillfully than that in getting to the heart of what's going on for people. But that, what you discover needs to be at the heart of their intervention, doesn't it? Unique to them. So working on those things is absolutely crucial. If we're not listening to you, then we're actually not listening to the service user. We need to be getting back to some of the heart of that for people. And that's where outcomes fit in. And that's where outcomes give us some hope, I think, and that we could be having a different kind of conversation with our service users and with each other. We're moving away from problem-focused care plans. We're moving away from task-focused care plans and trying to get to a point where we really do understand what's at the heart of things for people. Um, and those are the things that help people feel as fulfilled as they can be. So changes people are facing and your, your point um, there about our choices right up until the point of end of life. So important that people don't get a plan inflicted on them. They have as much power over that as possible. But every step of the way, people are facing things they haven't faced before, and they're difficult to do. And very often, our service users are saying more than one thing to us at once. You know, in the learning disabilities, we might have families who are saying, we want our son to be independent. We cared for him for 17 years. We want him to be independent. And they're also saying uh, we want him to be safe as houses and as safe as he was when he was living with us. People are saying more than one thing at once. How are they resolving that? We're listening to them to understand the difficulties they have in actually achieving what they need to achieve. It's not a straightforward conversation about what matters when people are needing more than one thing at once. So. Um, I know we're all thinking about change all the time, and I know my conversation with myself on a Sunday night. I don't know if this happens to you, but most Sunday nights, I think about the week coming, and I think, mm, next week is the week I'm going to get a much better work-life balance. That's my plan. Next week, I'm going to do more exercise. I'm going to eat more healthily. I'm going to have so much better conversation with my children. <laughs> I'm going to get a better pattern and go in there. I'm going to visit elderly relatives more often. I have lots of ideas about what will improve my life as I go forward into a new week. Do, do people resonate with that? And I have those plans, and I know absolutely that it will improve things if I could make it happen. It's very hard to make it happen. So there's the intention, and then there's the actual result. Uh, you may have other things that are on your mind on a Sunday night, but these are some of mine. So just thinking about all of those things um, and trying to improve things doesn't necessarily translate into making it happen. So I just want you to imagine for a minute those things you were thinking about. And when we have a bit of a break in a minute, stretch our legs, no coffee, but I mean, um, we, you could think that when you're coming back into the room, I'm going to say, right, this is your moment to make a commitment to that change. It's going to happen, Rhoda, now, today. And it's going to happen now today because I've chosen the time and I've chosen the place. So I'm going to say to you, come on, let's get on with it. You know it's going to improve your life. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. 
How are you feeling about that issue right now? How many people feel a bit under pressure? <laughs> Quite a few people feeling under pressure. It's your issue, but it's my agenda. That makes a difference, doesn't it, to how you're feeling. And how are you feeling about me? You can tell me. My shoulders are broad. How do you feel about me presenting this make your life better change thing? Yeah. How do I know? So it feels bossy. It feels a bit pushy. It feels, you feel a bit resentful. control. Yeah, I've taken control. And, and that feels, so. Yes, that it might, you know, I might make some sort of judgment about that. That I have not done very well in terms of a good beginning with you. Something that was important to you but right now, I've made things worse, and I certainly haven't built a level of trust between us that could mean that we could be part of what could make a difference from here. A bad start. So thinking about what we're talking to local authority staff about is get right into the beginning of your engagement with people and do something that feels like a good beginning. And when you get better beginnings, you get better outcomes. And they're proving that time and time again. If you have a bad start, then we're kind of fighting and wrestling all the way along. Um, and we've often got the wrong care plan for the wrong person. Because you need to listen, we need to listen, they need to listen. So they need the time to invest at the beginning um, in having those kinds of conversations. You know, um, when I think about some of the things I'm thinking about changing, one of the things I think about regularly is if I could just get to the gym more often and do more exercise, that would help my arthritis. Now, I know that that's really important for me. Uh, and I know the facts about it, and I know that that exercise will help. <coughs> but there's another rotor inside here. And she says, where am I going to fit all that in? I'm all over the country. I've got no routines. And quite honestly, when I get there, it hurts. So there's two rotors going, having that internal argument. And I'm having that argument, and I'm trying to resolve it in such a way that I could improve things for myself. But I'm going to have to get over that myself. Now, I might meet with you, and you might know all the evidence about doing more exercise will help my arthritis. And you might just step onto that side of it, and you might say, well, maybe you could have a map of where all the different pleasure centers are, and maybe you could do this, maybe you could do that. As soon as you do that, you care about me and you're trying to help, but as soon as you do that, you've taken half of my internal argument away. You've taken one half of it away. So the other one is still left here. Where am I going to fit all that in? So I was having an argument with myself because of the way this conversation is going. I now am having an argument with you. So that is not a good beginning. People comfortable with that as a concept. If we try and fix too soon, if we try and step on, if we have an opinion of what makes life better, you shut down an internal dialogue that people have to have the right to have if they're going to resolve things and be in the driving seat um, for the change they're going to make. Is everyone happy with that as a concept? So we're talking to local authorities, we're talking to social workers about ensure that you help people explore these things rather than jump too quickly on what a plan might look like in order to fix things. So thinking about those things is how we're helping people um, at a local authority level just invest a bit more thought time and uh, um, thinking at the beginning. Just thinking about that change you were contemplating and thinking about how important it is to you and what kind of score you'd give that level of importance. For me, managing the physical pain and being as healthy as I want, I might probably give that an eight or a nine you know, in terms of importance. My confidence to make that change and keep it, so I'm down at a four. So I need to think about that a little bit more and try and manage it differently. And you may have had, you may have a similar experience when you start to think about the change you had in mind. We have to, and we're helping social workers think about, take confidence into our thinking when we're engaging with people about change. You know, I think of a, a father who'd had a stroke um, and was trying to work his way back from this stroke. And the worker turns up 
to see the whole family. Um, and the family are all saying, he needs the service to get him into town, he's not seen his friends in ages, he, he needs his friends in his life, you need to get a taxi service and so on. Now, the worker could have said, well, that's, I'm sorry, that's not what we do, or got into all kind of that wrangle, but they didn't. They had a conversation with dad and the family about what was going on. And what emerged from that conversation was the father able to say, it is really important for me to get back to my friends. I want to see them. However, right now, I'm not even sure I can get up that steep drive, if, you know, even if there was a way of getting there. But more importantly, I'm really not ready to eat in front of my friends. I'm not confident. I will be too embarrassed. So what emerged out of that conversation was the family understanding what was actually happening to him. And so it wasn't just about what his outcome was, it was about where he was in the whole process and where his confidence was. And the family all said, well, we can help with that, Dad. We can practice having meals together. You can let us know when you feel good enough about the eating to actually think that you could see Bert and Dave. So it wasn't even a service. It was the family working on that together. So if we don't take confidence into account, we can miss some of those things and people kind of get dragged into what looks like a solution. Well-meaning, but not the right thing for the person at the right time. So we have to take confidence into consideration. So our starting point is understanding that change is never easy. And one of the things that I guess you do with your staff is help people think about that, help think about the sensitivity of the conversation, and most importantly, how they transmit that empathic understanding to people that what they're facing is tough. Because that in its very, on its own, is a service, that empathic understanding. Just one of the things that with social, depart social work departments and social workers we're helping people think about is actually conjure up actual cases and start to think about what it might feel like to be that person facing the kind of change they're facing. Is anybody aware of this uh, image? So what we're saying, take a case, for instance, um, an elderly gentleman whose wife died four years ago, missed her enormously, started to drink to deal with the, guilt, the, the grief of that and the loneliness. That's escalating, he's drinking more and more. His daughter is so tired of the arguments and she won't allow him to have his grandson over to see him. So he hasn't, that, those relationships are breaking down and he's losing uh, all self-care and care of his home. Imagine what he might say about step one. What might he say are the good things about carrying on drinking the way he is? Numbs everything out. It works to just numb out those feelings. The, the grief from the loss of my wife, but the more recent shame and guilt uh, of how I'm managing things. So it blots all that out. What else might he say? Are the good things about carrying on drinking? The only people I've still got. Sure. But he might be saying, the, the only people I've got left in my life, because my daughter won't talk to me now because of the way I am, is the people I go drinking with. So that gives me something in the day. In fact, this whole thing gives me a sense of purpose because my long, lonely day has significant moments in it when I have a drink. When I, that fills my day, and when I do drink, it numbs the pain. Good reasons for carrying on. What might he say here are the not-so-good things about carrying on drinking the way he is? That relationship Yeah. I'm, lo I'm losing my relationship with my, my daughter. I can't see my grandson. That is a source of real pain for me. He might be say, thinking, you know, if my wife could see me, this isn't me. This isn't me. How I used to care for myself and our home, she would be ashamed of me. I'm unwell. I feel depressed. I feel anxious and I feel unwell. I'm not eating properly. All of those things he might say in that box. What if he were to describe step three? What would be the not so good things about stopping drinking for him? If I stopped drinking, what would be the not so good things? Yeah, 
I have to deal with all those feelings. Everything I've held in bay, at bay, all the guilt, all the loss, all the grief, comes flooding in. Nerve ends exposed, no protection, just comes rushing in like a tsunami. I'm feeling anxious and, up, and, and settled by the withdrawal thing. I've got my whole long dark day empty in front of me with nothing to fill it but the pain. That is not an easy place to be. That is hard for him to even imagine. What might he say are the good things about stopping drinking? Box four. So I could have a chance that one day I could build a bridge back to my daughter. I could read my grandson a bedtime story. I could be physically stronger. I could be making the whole, this home a home my wife would be proud of. All those things. That's his outcome. And we can see that unless he's had a chance to articulate what's in box four, box three is too hard. Things get worse before they get better. And he needs to have a chance to articulate his outcome before we start pushing in any way to um, take over that change. Empathy with box three is crucial. Where a lot of the conversations go on between workers and him, well-meaning, is here. People say, don't you realise your health is running down? You know, if you, kept, if you stopped drinking, you'd have a better relationship with your daughter. If you stopped drinking, you'd be able to see your grandson. You'd be able to take care of your home and to have more money. And he's going, oh, yes, but look. Box three. So what we're trying to help social workers, for all workers to think about is how we have a conversation with people about the outcome that makes the pain of getting through the change meaningful and worthwhile. And you can think about any, any situation you deal with has a similar element to it. You know, if the behavior was about how do I let go of how much I'm in charge of my son's life? How do I, you know, how do, I do less for mum because I'm taking care of her and my whole life's going, I'm exhausted. If we're busy saying to people, you must stop caring for your mum so much because otherwise your life's going to collapse and you can't take care of your own children if you carry on the way you are. She thinks, yes, but look at box three. I promised her, what if somebody doesn't do it as well as me? All those things. We have to help people articulate outcomes if we're going to help them through a change. So this kind of empathy, building up empathy and understanding is a really useful supervision discussion around cases. People are happy with that. And again, it takes us closer to those good beginnings rather than trying to rush to a plan that fixes to people. We're actually understanding how hard that change is. So the most important thing is building empathy and again we know that if you listen to service users about why they had a decent service and what they thought about that service at the top of that list is they listened to me they listened and understood tried to understand so empathy is a service engaging with people in that way is a service the just the natural human warmth of the relationship has within it a sense of well-being if i'm seeing myself through the light through your eyes and you care about me and you're transmitting warmth in that moment I feel better about who I am so we need to be constantly working alongside our staff to help them think about how important those things are we do need to focus on the most important things that people are concerned about but we need to be hearing it from them not telling them what it is and that's a different conversation and we need to engage with people about what concerns them most as individuals and as families. And we also need to be looking for strengths. Because if we've got used to picking up care plans or going out to see people, assessing deficits, then we don't have the conversation and we don't notice. So, you know, for, for staff going into a home with five people who are all got an opinion and they're very strident in expressing it, that we might think, oh, oh, that's a lot to cope with. On the other hand, the positives about that is they've all got a part to play. They could be part of the solution. There are people around who care. So we're thinking about that whole dynamic process and we're looking for strengths. You know, uh, strengths approaches have not had the time and space that they needed. We're not thinking as often as we need to be about the resource the person has and their family has and how they can use that resource to get to an outcome they want. 
we need to be having those conversations um, as much as we possibly can to hear the resources that people have. And that approach would be the right approach whatever stage of austerity or wealth in the country we might be, because empowerment fits in with well-being. And I don't know how you all feel, but um, we are at the most difficult time resource-wise. We have to be out there and we have to be marching with our banners saying a civilised society that we live in needs to resource its infrastructure to care for people. We have to be doing that. Um, but we also need to be, when we're having the conversation with the service user, we don't have that banner conversation about resources, do we? We talk to the service user about, what is it about you that's helping you come through this time with so little support? How are you coping with the disappointment? How are you managing being on a waiting list that's long? What is it that you're doing that's helping you get through? That's the conversation we have with that person because that's an empowering conversation. So there's two things going on. We need to fight for resources, but we also need to help people see the resource that they are in the difficult, challenging circumstances they face. So those two things have to go hand in hand. So this um, is an approach that I know people here care about. Person-centered care is, you're no strangers to that. That's been a consistent process for you. But we want to try and make that the mainland so everyone is having that conversation and taking that approach. So we're going to have a little break now in a minute. But local authorities are investing across Wales in good beginnings. They're engaging with people and helping them explore their hopes and their fears before putting a plan in place. It's so important to help people have that conversation. They're thinking about their options and the pros and cons of all of that, not assuming that there's a right way, but engaging with people in a unique way. They're helping people determine, therefore, their own best course of action. And that point you were making about flexibility. What my best course of action today, I need to think about how that's all feeling in a few weeks' time and take stock of that again. Flexibility. Helping people build on their strengths and practice new ways of being in a situation that they're struggling with. Certainly helping them notice their achievements. You know, the strengths bit isn't just us kind of not acknowledging or noticing sometimes, it's service users don't notice. So helping people notice those things and express a sense of um, hope that comes from them noticing the things that they're facing. The point about anticipating threats, so this is go, you've made all those changes, what might happen in the future and how might you approach that? And really when there are hiccups along the way, and there will be hiccups along the way for everyone, how do they stay at the heart of that? It's not a moment to say, oh, well, the plan didn't work. This is about helping people talk through what's going well and what isn't. Those are the kinds of conversations that are being encouraged at a local authority level and hopefully are coming through into the interactions that you have with them. We've heard some evidence of that. So thinking about what we're looking for in local authority changes and also thinking about how we can influence that. If we have an interface conversation with um, local authorities, how can we help them think about the outcomes we're seeing and how they can integrate that into their planning process. So it's a, a two-way learning process that's going on. Uh, so we just need to make sure that we're getting um, as much impact from the potential we have, uh, and if we don't, that we'll be creating that stress. So the only way we can ascertain how people feel is by supporting the skilled staff, having sensitive conversations, learning those things. Um, and that means we have to hold ourselves too to account. You know, what are we telling our staff is their role and function? What does it say in their role profile? Well, how do we interview people? Do we tell people that we're interested in their conversations? We need to be doing all of that, don't we? Because otherwise people don't recognize that that's what we need and want from them. So if we're going to move away from tasks, we really do need to have regard to um, the insights that our staff have about service users and families' needs. So thinking about that and also helping people explore more about what people are doing and achieving and can do, not just about what they can't do and what we are going to do for them. So all of that is happening um, at a local authority level. One of the things that's happening is that every we're working towards every single case that social workers hold having a summary sheet that looks like this. Now, it looks straightforward, but 
Um, it is about really honing down the information so, and putting it on the system. So every system, IT system, will have a heart of the matter summary. So in supervision, for instance, um, the social worker will be describing whether or not they've got and achieved a family outcome. Yes, we're there, we know what we're all working towards, or we're not yet, we still need a few discussions because there's difficult things to decide. Are the family able to describe what the priority risks are? that um, they're trying to avoid? And have they had a chance to develop a plan that enables them to do that? Where this is happening across the country, we're seeing a, a real focus that is bringing down emergency calls, bringing down emergency call-outs, EDTs, less involved, all of those kind of things, because actually on the system is a description of what the family know to do if things are uh, difficult. But it is a process, so there's still work to do. The social worker might be saying what needs to happen is that I, this specialist service needs to be engaged. Another provider is going to help <coughs> us get where we want to get. Where are we now? Well, we're at a point where people have made a lot of changes, but they need this bit of support, and where do we hope to get to? Which brings us back round to defining an outcome. So this is one sheet of A4, if it was printed off. It's right at the front of the screens and gives people the heart of the matter. Does that pretty much reflect anything that you hold in your own casework in your, uh, for your own service users? Something that kind of holds the heart of it? Have you got similar things, some people nodding? Just captures, not the task, but the process towards outcomes and how people are being engaged as much as possible. You know, um, there is so much information out there being pushed around in lots of boxes. And I um, have read more unified assessments in my career than I ever want to think about. And I would read those documents, and I'd know the skilled worker who'd filled it in, but I couldn't see the family, I couldn't see the heart of it, I couldn't see what was going on. And we need to enable people to write things down in such a way that really gets to the heart of the matter for, for them. So worth thinking about, but more of this happening at a local authority level. And then they're being asked to measure. So if we're having those conversations with people, we would be able to say to someone, where were you when we first met you? Where was it that you wanted to be? And where are you now? So people have panicked a bit about a scoring system, but the heart of this is it's a very subjective view. Because we don't need to know what the outcome is, we just need to know people have had the conversation. Because written down in the case notes will be what the outcome is. But just this is a purely subjective description. And for our service users, whatever means of communication we know are best, we would be trying to help them get to a point where they were able to say, when I first met you, this is how I was feeling, this is what was happening to me, um, what I'd like to do is get to this way of feeling and this way of being, this is where I am now and this is how things have helped. Measuring the impact of our services, our accountability. And when you think about accountability, it doesn't lie in all those controls of have I ticked this box, is there a signed contract uh, care plan? It might not mean anybody knows what's in the care plan or how relevant it is for them, but have we signed it? You know, those things aren't enough, are they, to be re really accountable to people about what's going on in their lives. The most important thing is the impact um, that we've had alongside people, helping them to define their outcomes. So local authorities are being required to evidence and it's worth thinking about how you and, and we share each other with each other how people are moving towards those outcomes. So, what does an outcome look like? There's been a lot of conversations about that and a lot of banding around about things, but um, it isn't the resource, that's us, or the activity. Um, that's what we do with people, who we are, what we do with people, what our services do. Um, and then the outputs are how many of those things we do, how many people we see, how many visits, how many times, at what level, that's an output. The outcome is the impact of all of that. The impact is the thing we just talked about. I was here, now I'm here, and that's because of the things that we're doing together. So getting to describing an outcome is about describing the impact in that much more holistic way. The uh, whole of gathering information has been very outputs heavy. Thinking about um, you know, what people are doing, how much of what people are doing, rather than to what end 
are we all doing it? So there's a big difference and what Welsh Government are recognising and at a local level is we have to let go, free people up for some of this tyranny of information giving about outputs and get more to the heart of the matter about outcomes. So that should ultimately reduce those piles of paper and boxes that we all have to fill in to justify our existence and get us to a much more meaningful thing that describes the impact we all have together on the service user. You may not be seeing um, much of that change yet, but we really hope you can get to a point where you don't have to fill in so many boxes and so much information and get to this more meaningful description. And in thinking about outcomes, clearly using all the skills you already use. Someone living with dementia, how do we help them? The voice of the child, how do we help that voice be heard? So we're not just assuming that being able to describe an outcome is a direct communication. All the skills you use to help people describe what's going on in their lives are absolutely relevant. So ensuring that that still happens. So just briefly at your tables, I wondered if we could bring this to life a little bit. Have a think about an actual service user that you know well. If you were with them, if you were thinking about them, how would they describe their outcome? What would their overall outcome, not a task or a thing, but overall, what would they be trying to achieve? What's most important to them? Do you want to just have that bit of discussion at your tables and having articulated that think about the way in which your service contributes to them meeting that outcome is that okay just have that conversation at the tables bring the service user into the room clearly an outcome is not a service a service is a means to an end and um, when I first started working with teams of social workers and asked them to describe outcomes they listed services took them a little while to shift into thinking about actually what end does that service produce. So yes, somebody might want to go on a perpetrator group or a, a family therapy group, whatever, but that doesn't mean there won't be any violence in the home again. What they actually want is to manage their uh, feelings in such a way that doesn't lead to violence in their home. That's what they want. The group is a means to an end. So just listing whether people attend things or not doesn't tell you whether things are changing. So helping people to describe things uh, in their own words is the most important part. So here's some examples from conversations with service users. Um, someone saying, I can ensure my daughter gets to school. I can show her the love I feel through hugs and reading at bedtime. I can manage stress without drinking and let my family know when I need help. Those are all outcome conversations and if we're noticing them we can help people turn that into something they describe as their outcome. I can reduce the stress on my daughter and stay at home whilst maintaining a link with my friend. She knows there's more involved with just I just I want to be independent it's not what she's saying. She's saying I would like to stay at home and reduce the stress on my daughter who's worried about me and have these. Th she's describing her bigger picture and we need to hear it. I can reduce my family's fears and anxiety whilst also spending time on my own and having time in the garden. That person knows that the family are stressing and that might end up restricting her freedom, but she has a role in helping them reduce their anxiety. You can hear the outcomes as they start to emerge in the conversations. I will have come to terms with this change and I'll be focusing more on the positives. Um, I think your point about change, constant change one of the things people have as an outcome is coming to terms with difficult things that are happening in my life. And it's the very conversation I'm having with you that's helping me come to terms. So that is a reasonable outcome to emerge. How would we help in your coming to terms? Or I will be feeling more confident. How can we help with building that confidence? They're reasonable outcomes. So outcomes are not described as services. They're described as these things. And we're trying to help the social workers to recognise them when they hear them in the conversation and build on them. As a result of that, um, we can get to an outcome which is a well-defined picture that the service user can describe. Your young woman would be able to describe in her... You could tell us in her words what she has about. You know your service users and you can tell us that bigger picture and what they'd say. 
And it's not measured by the ups and downs of each day. So people have got a bit stuck with that. You know, social workers might have grasped the measurement tool and then they're asking people every time they see them, you know, whether, and, and we all have good days and bad days. So it's more about that overall outcome that matters and, and keeping um, on track for that. So here's a couple of examples of people reflecting on having achieved their outcomes. Not some fantastic gold standard thing off the planet, but something real for them. I still have some low days, but I know that if I talk to my friend Mary, it helps me through those. Ultimately, I can still look out of the window and see the view I love. I can still ring my daughter in Australia and have a warm conversation with her. It can be lonely sometimes, but I really like the people who call each day. They know me and they understand my sense of humour. And of course, I still have my postman and milkman who've been calling for so many years. I'm still part of my community and it's okay. It's the best it can be for me. Very realistic description of this is okay. This is where I've come to and this is okay. It's got the most important things in it for her and she's reconciled and in charge. There's an example from child protection. This young mum. My children are much more settled. They are talking more and playing well together. We have meals together and cuddles at bedtime. There are tough days. I miss my boyfriend and feel lonely. But I remind myself of all the positives we have achieved. This is the mum I wanted to be. I am making new friends gradually and finding ways of talking to people I trust when I feel low. This is her outcome. That's where she's got to. You can feel it, can't you? You can feel all the work that young woman has done. You can feel all the sensitive work that the worker has done with her to help her achieve what she sees as her outcome. She has made difficult decisions. She's pushed the boyfriend out of her life because she needs to focus on her children. She's made difficult decisions. You can feel everything behind there, but it speaks volumes. So this is her outcome, and she is satisfied with all the pain and discomfort that, and challenges still, that she's got the right things, uh, and she's working at the right things. So people are happy that those represent outcomes, and that if people were asking you about your service users and could see some of these phrases coming off the page, they'd know all the work that's gone behind that helps them know that outcomes are at the heart of the work. Does everybody feel comfortable with that? You know, I think of a, an, a, an example um, in terms of people trying to put services in of a, a young man, he'd had a, um, a car accident and he was very disabled by it and he was a soldier. Um, and everybody felt terrible for him. Young man with his heart, whole life changed. Um, and they were trying to throw all these services into his home and he was rejecting them all. He was angry, he didn't want people in his house. Um, and at one point the social worker said to him, this is so hard for you. You used to be the person who saved people, you protected people, you were the strong one who looked after everyone. And now we're all throwing these things at you, these trappings that represent a world you just don't want to face. And he said, that is how I feel. I hate all these metal things, all these contraptions. I don't want any of this in my home. And then he said, on the other hand, if I can't get upstairs and share a bed with my wife, if I have to stay down here, then that feels terrible. I need to have that in my life, that normality of sharing a bed with my wife. As a result of that, I'm going to have to accept some of the things you're offering me. That's his outcome. That's what he's working towards. That conversation is part of a process that he is going to have to continue going through. But just giving him everything without helping him to articulate something that he can be in control of is not what he wants. So services aren't an outcome. Helping people to articulate what's important to them is crucial. Are people happy with those examples, yeah. But remember the examples you gave because it's your work, your knowledge, your sensitivity and insight that really matters. You're at the heart of this. 
I just wanted, I can see some people anxious to go. Yeah, really, so my daughter's actually school clerk at council, so I'm just having some somebody. Yeah, important right? things in life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, we, won't, we won't be long, but I just wanted to spend a little time, if everybody else is okay, are they time waste, just to think about some of the conversations we're trying to influence at local authority level with the conversations social services have with other professionals. What used to happen in the old world was that they'd have a referral that was often very negative and deficit described. So you need to be doing something in social services because this is the problem and this is the risk. Um, and then there was a kind of decision about whether it hit criteria and thresholds and was a person's responsibility. And all of that just kind of increased the anxieties often of the people on both ends of this phone referral. So what's happening is trying to have a much more rounded conversation right from the beginning, which better reflects the act and the approach that is being um, attempted to achieve. And that moves into uh, MDT conversations, multidisciplinary teams, core groups, and so on. But these are some of the examples of the kinds of conversations people are having at the front line now with professionals. What do you feel they're saying to people is the priority need for this person or this family? You know, what's the most important thing that's going on? Because often people referring know much more than they end up telling us because they only tell us about the problem or the deficit. Uh, what specifically concerns you? Really getting a feel from this professional. What have you noticed when things are going well? Not a question someone referring into social services has expected to hear. So that beginning of exploring, there is more going on here than just the problem. There are strengths in this person, this family, this process. We want to hear from that professional what those things are. And then beginning of that tentative discussion about outcomes, if you were less concerned, what would be happening? What would you hope for in terms of how, you, how things might improve? What do you specifically want from us? And how do you see us keeping in touch as things progress so we can maintain that flexibility because things change over time? So that gradually is changing things uh, over time. When we think about the constant reflection on changes, who knows best the impact of the changes over time? Who knows best? Who should we be listening to? The individual. Uh, and then uh, who else might know? and carers, I guess. You know, and often, they're quite low. All of that isn't being listened to in the right way. We need to listen to the service user, the family, and the workers closest to the family. That's how we'll know what's gradually changing, what's needed, what, what we need to adjust, and how flexible we need to be. So we need due regard to all the key people. We need <coughs> regular review, and that's a review of the person and their outcomes, not a review of the service. We've got to get to that. CSIW are understanding that. Inspections are understanding that. We review outcomes, not service. And that is true accountability, and it really holds the person at the heart of what's going on. We need respectful, collaborative conversations, and that will lead to the best service and trying to uh, engage across the piece. So I guess what we're saying in terms of um, our future aspirations is that we create more flexibility, that we allow for the things changing over time, we listen respectfully to everybody closely involved. That is, that, those would be signs of success in us moving in the right direction. That we were allowing for change, anticipating change, including families, including that dynamic process. Most people do not want to be rescued from their families. Most people want us to rescue the strength and strengthen the family to help them resolve difficult situations. So we need to be thinking about how we engage people and help them to empathize with each other and strengthen those relationships as they prepare for a future. It's a difficult thing that people are facing. How do they strengthen the way in which they relate to one another? You know, I think of a, a case of an elderly gentleman who's got four sons, only one of them is still visiting, the youngest. When he comes, he brings alcohol with him. When he goes away, his dad gives him money. That went all the way to Pova because the system took over, interpreted it as financial exploitation. 
He doesn't want the only child who's still visiting him to be seen as an exploiter. He's been all his life worried about that boy and caring for him. He knows this is an issue. Yes, it would be useful, and it came back down to the social worker, because, of course, a group of professionals at Pover can't do anything about it. So it was all a waste of time, really. And then it comes back down to the social worker having a conversation, helping dad and his son think about how they take things forward. We need to be thinking about people. Once we get into rigid safeguarding, we lose sight of how people keep themselves safe and what's important to them. And then what you were saying earlier, we put our own language on that to turn it into something that it's not. So we need to be really careful about those things. And what people have found is if they pay more attention to the relationships and engaging with people, hidden harm is going down because we're hearing more about what's happening and therefore people are able to address how they resolve those things for themselves. So when we're having those conversations with our, the families, the people we're working with, we're constantly saying to them, what are you pleased about? What, what are you are pleased you've achieved? It might be that he's saying, I'm really keeping my room tidy and that means the anxieties are coming down and I have more freedom as a result. So he, hearing those things in those conversations you're having and then being able to capture them. What challenges do you still face? Well, it's difficult sometimes, um, but this is what I'm doing to try and overcome that. Where are you now and where were you when you first met? So if we can get these conversations about measuring impact into the more natural thing that you do every day in your working lives, then it doesn't feel so difficult or unwieldy. It's partly about feeling confident that the conversations you have are already part of the, the act and part of what's the spirit of the act. So thinking about our organisations, we need to help people develop the understanding about their role and their function and how much their conversations are part of what they do. One of the things that uh, people are saying is that all the training we give staff is absolutely knowledge heavy and skills light. They get inundated with things they have to know. And it's overwhelming and it can kind of grind people to a halt. Look at everything they already know their sensitivity to people who are in challenging sex situations, the power of their conversations. It's 80, 90% of what they do. So let's ensure that the training support we give is skills heavy. The knowledge is important, but we need to get um, attention to the skills. We need to have good conversations between staff about the impact they've had on service users. It's motivating, it's empowering, it's inspiring. The stories that you described today, they inspire people. So we need to share those with each other. And then it becomes much easier to write down that desired outcome and share it with the other professionals involved as well. So when we think about the heart of the matter in collecting subjective data, you already know what that subjective data is. It's just a question of finding a way of capturing it. And that's what we're saying to local authorities. So think about what the skills are, help people to share and listen to each other and inspire each other. Think about our support systems, supervision, training. What does our organisation say about what's most important to us and how do we act that out? Um, does our, is our system a good fit for what we're saying the role of our staff is and how we want to support them? We need a consistent approach. So I guess for all of us, in the light of this act, we can all be saying, are we asking, can we ask better questions of ourselves and others? Uh, can we describe clearly what an outcome-focused working process is? Can we deepen the commitment to staff skills and confidence? Give permission to people to do the things that they're doing best? Can we collectively discuss what needs to change and therefore have more effective cross-agency conversations? That's where we're trying to get to. And we all have the opportunity to take those proactive opportunities to change the way people are thinking and responding. So some of the feedback from our eight, 18 months of pilot areas is a real impact on the way in which organizations are changing. And generally people saying something good is happening here. We're hearing more of the real issues, wasting less time, getting better results, and able, therefore, to shift resources to things that more of the things that we need and want for people. If we can't do that, then it's the service users we care about who uh, ultimately feel the impact of that. So it's, um, it's something people are welcoming, this opportunity to really challenge and change the way things are. 
So what would be really helpful to us is if we had um, a chance to hear from you any, anything that struck you from today. There's also an evaluation document that we'll bring around, just brief, if you could put those messages down. Um, but any thoughts that come out of a brief discussion now that you might want to say to Fiona, take that back to Social Care Wales. These are the important things that struck me from today that we need more attention for. <laughs>